Unsung Heroes doesn't tend to be a series where we talk about crossovers and 4x4s and SUVs all that often. And the reasons why are fairly obvious. They don't tend to be that interesting, and the vast majority of good ones tend to be very well known, because it's a very recent phenomenon. SUVs have technically been around for a long time, but high performance ones? Not so much. That is a much more modern thing, especially in the 2010s and onward. Stuff like the Volkswagen Touaregs, the Porsche Cayennes, the Audi Q7 V12, Range Rovers, of course they were around in the 2000s, many of the ones that I just mentioned, but they've really come into their own in the past decade or so, having these really, really high performance models, and especially in the past, say, three or four years, where you've started to see these true exotic brands getting in on the game as well. Not just brands like Land Rover, who were already doing that to some degree, but brands like Rolls-Royce, Bentley, Lamborghini, Maserati, even Ferrari now. Now that is an interesting market, but this car did it first, or at least it tried to. And this is the kind of vehicle, of course it's a spiker, you saw that from the thumbnail, from the title, and it's the kind of car which is very much what I would call a Marmite vehicle. You don't need to wonder whether or not you like the car. Your initial impressions will pretty much tell you everything you need to know. You'll either think, wow, that is really cool, or you'll think, that is the most hideous, bloated looking thing I've ever seen. And I can kind of understand both of those things. But as far as concept cars go, funnily enough, a lot of my favorite ones actually tend to be very big. The Cadillac Sien, the Chrysler Phaeton, this one, a number of others too, they're quite big, unwieldy looking cars. But I like cars that have a lot of presence. They're big and opulent looking. Sometimes they wouldn't necessarily work in a production sense, but as a concept at least, they look cool to me. And part of that even stems back from my childhood of seeing something like a Chrysler Phaeton in Gran Turismo 2 for the first time when I was about seven years old, and I've always loved stuff like that ever since. Oddball, weird, kind of dumb, but still cool at the same time. Now what this car represented is not as simple as it seems. This wasn't just another company making an SUV for the sake of getting in on the market. The ironic thing here is, it's actually the exact opposite. What Spiker did with this car was actually ahead of the curve. It wasn't in the curve, and it certainly wasn't after it. These cars are coming out now, in the 2010s. This car was 2006. You're talking well over a decade ahead of its time. There were no super SUVs on the market. SSUVs, as we've talked about before. We've even talked about some of the cars that birthed that phenomena, even as early as the late 80s and 90s. But this one was the first, arguably, of the 2000s to try and put that into practice. This wasn't just a design exercise, it was a car that they had very realistic goals for. Now the car actually, and a lot of people don't know this, has two forms. The D12, which is the very well-known one, the darker one of the two, it's dark and chrome, and then there's the D8, which is technically a renamed and refitted version, especially with regard to the engine that came out later on. And that one actually happened closer to 2010. Now the project unfortunately kind of just died in 2014, so it had a relatively long gestation run, but it never came to anything. Not too surprising, but the funny thing is, this car could have done a lot for the Spyker brand. Unfortunately, part of the plan that they had was to use Saab, which of course they owned for a short while, to help with the production of this vehicle. And in a funny kind of way, the residuals of that kind of deal actually held on for a little bit longer, up around 2010, because the D8 version, later on, was planning to use also, like Saab, a GM engine. From Cadillac, though. But we'll get to that in just a second. Now, as far as the initial car, this 2006 D8, or technically the D8 Peking to Paris concept, it's named after something which a lot of people, especially younger people, don't know about Spiker, and that is that they've been around for a long time. This is not a company like Koenigsegg or Pagani, which is one guy's garden shed supercar that happened to become successful. As great as they are, of course, I love Koenigsegg and Pagani. No, Spiker is an old brand, a very old brand. They actually go as far back even as the 1800s building carriages, before engines were even a thing. So, of course, having a car that references a race from 1907 
kind of ties into that because that event, the Peking to Paris rally, wasn't just some Colin McRae style rally stage. It was a three month event. And a Spiker, which was barely even modified way back in 1907, finished second overall in that event. That's impressive for a brand which is typically thought of as being more of a luxury mark, and they still are. That's very impressive for the car to have that kind of durability, so it pays homage in a very appropriate way to one of the most successful cars they've ever built. Unfortunately, this car didn't get the chance to live up to that, because of course the off-road routes would have been very cool to see this one in action replicating, albeit with a significantly more powerful engine behind it, but... Speaking of that performance and of that engine, the initial D12, as the name suggests, is powered by a 12-cylinder engine. Interestingly though, not from Saab, not from GM, initially from Volkswagen, which again, in a funny kind of way, ties into a different connection that Spyker continued to have, and that is the Volkswagen AG Group. Before Saab and GM and all that kind of stuff, they were hand in hand to some degree with the VAG group because they use Audi engines. The C8 Laviolet uses a, an Audi V8, various others, the Aleron even, and others too. This one was using a 6 litre bi turbo Volkswagen W12, a similar engine to what you can find in the Phaeton W12 and the Touareg W12 both of which are very fast, so a pretty hefty engine. Now that engine produces 500 horsepower. And again, you've got to bear in mind, 2006, 500 horsepower SUV in 2006. That's a lot earlier than the Audi Q7 V12 had 500 horsepower. That's way more than the Touareg had. Even the W12 Touareg had 450. So this was a serious contender. That's more powerful than most of the Porsche KNs, which pretty much dominated the high-performance SUV market in the earlier and even mid-2000s. Now, in terms of performance, this thing was rapid because, and this is no surprise coming from Spyker, it's a lot lighter than most other SUVs. Most are 2.3, 2.4, even 2.6 tons, sometimes even more. This is 1.8, less than a Veyron. That's remarkable <laughs> for something with four doors, four seats, all wheel drive, and a big engine. And just look at the interior. This thing is full of opulent styling and luxury. It looks, as far as I'm concerned, gorgeous on the inside, and it has possibly the prettiest looking center console display I have ever seen, to put a Tesla to shame, for sure. Now, as far as the performance goes, to get back to that for a second, when you combine the fact that it has Q7 V12 power, but in something that weighs basically half a ton to a full ton less than your average SUV, the performance is good. Five seconds dead to 60 was the claim, Again, 2006, and the top speed over 180. Now, whether or not it could have actually done 180 remains to be seen, but the fact that it's that much lighter and also, even more importantly, significantly more aerodynamically efficient than most SUVs, since this thing basically looks like a jacked-up supercar in comparison with much more of a crossover coupe style, again, something that we've only just started to see in the mainstream of SUVs in the past couple of years. Again, it's believable. I fully believe that this car could probably exceed 180. Now, as it turned out, the only place that you can actually exceed that speed with the vehicle is in Test Drive Unlimited 2, as far as I'm aware, because you can drive this car in the game. But the version of the car that's in the game brings me to the second point. And the second one is of special import to me because it's actually my favorite concept car of all time. To the point where, in recent months in fact, before producing this episode, it's actually knocked off the previous favorite concept car for me. Because my favorite concept car was, as many of you know who've watched the HSG Top 50, the Cadillac 16. I adore that car, and I still do. But the reason why this one just edges it out for me is because it's a combination of something as wacky as the Cadillac, but it combines that with the kind of real-world usability and practicality of my actual dream car, the Ferrari FF. And the only thing that stops this Spiker from being my dream car is the fact that you cannot buy it, which is kind of a problem when you're talking about dream cars. At least you can actually buy the Ferrari, so the Ferrari is safe for now. But as far as production goes, the story did not end with the D12 because 
Spiker was hoping that by purchasing Saab, they could use that, as I briefly mentioned earlier, to produce the car. And through those GM connections, they were planning to use a Cadillac sourced CTS V spec V8 around 2010. So, in a funny kind of way, again, it could have ended up having more power than the original W12 would have had, considering that nowadays those Cadillacs are putting out about 640 horsepower from those 6.2 litre V8s. So, this could have been a pretty monstrous SSUV. The performance easily would have matched what they originally claimed, maybe even more, because think about it, instead of this big, heavy, very complex, very costly W12 engine, they've got this easy to produce, easy to work on, far cheaper, far faster to assemble, and far more tunable GM V8 engine. That's a win-win. It's not as exotic as a W12, but it's a great option and a very smart business move. Unfortunately, Spiker almost went bankrupt in 2014, and that's where the car ended, because they decided to rein it in and to keep their focus on what they were already doing well, and that was selling supercars and super sports cars. And unfortunately, for now at least, they haven't really looked back since. To me, that's a real shame. And one of the biggest reasons why I think it's a shame, and this especially is directed toward the people who might say, well, it's a stupid car, I'm glad they never made it, they received over 100 customer orders to purchase this car when it was first seen in 2006 at the Geneva Motor Show. Over 100 people just at the show put down deposits or wanted to put down deposits to buy it. That shows you that even back then, the market was already there. The spark of super SUVs, which we're really still getting into right now with the brands like Lamborghini and Ferrari, well over a decade later, this car did it way before the curve. And even if you don't like it, you simply have to respect it for that. It's a car that almost predicted the market before there even was that aspect of the market. That's remarkable. I love it apart from that, but that to me, in combination with just how oddball it is to see a car this radical come out of a, an otherwise fairly traditional but very impressive exotic car company, it's wacky, but they could have made it work. I just think it's a shame that it never had the chance Part of me still hopes that it does, because the design itself is timeless as far as I'm concerned. Just update it with a more recent Spiker look, and you could easily produce it now. In fact, now more so than ever. But whether or not we will is another question entirely. Overall though, that's it for my thoughts on the Spiker D12 and the D8, my dream concept car. And of course, if you want to check out previous episodes of this series, you can click through right here at the end of the video. But for now, as always, Thanks for watching.